The PSB Audio Imagine T65. Now, I was loaned these to review by PSB directly. I'm going to hit you with some facts up front. These speakers are about one meter tall. They retail for about $2,000. They came out a few months ago, and they're pretty awesome. Now, they do need some equalization work, especially in the mid-range, because the mid-range is just kind of troughed off through there. Maybe about two bands of EQ to remedy some of that would do a, a really good job. And then what you're left with is a neutral speaker that gets really low in your room, lower than probably most speakers in this price range, at least in my experience. These do feature two six and a half inch mid bass drivers, a five and a quarter inch mid range, which is above the tweeter, and then a one inch titanium dome tweeter in a pretty shallow waveguide. Listen to these speakers, it's actually almost too bassy, which is a problem that I think would be good to have, especially for a home theater situation where you can go in and EQ that down. But as I listened more and more, what I realized was that it wasn't so much that it was too bassy. It was that there was a pretty wide mid-range dip. Now, I noticed that because I was watching television, or more specifically, I was watching movies. And as I'm watching these movies, I noticed that the, the dialogue and the content just wasn't, you know, at the forefront. Now, a lot of newer movies are just that way by default, and it's very aggravating. So then I'm listening to music a little bit later on and I kind of noticed like, man, something's just like I'm missing something and I could not figure out what it was. So let me give you a little bit of insight into, you know, kind of how I listen and how I review things. Specifically, when there is an issue, maybe a peak at four kilohertz sounds sibilant. Maybe a peak at eight kilohertz sounds sibilant for a different reason. Maybe a resonance in a lower male vocal is going to pop up as a, a resonance in the speaker around maybe 120 hertz or something like that. Those peaks, I'm better at identifying those pretty quickly and, and having a pretty good idea of what frequency region they're in. I'm not saying I can nail it with the first guess, but usually within an octave or so, I'm, I'm like, yeah, that sounds like it's probably around 800 hertz. And then I have an idea of where in the data to go look. But what I've noticed is that trends with speakers, meaning that let's say we have a speaker that is, has an elevated treble per the measurements. If that elevated treble is spread out from one kilohertz to 20 kilohertz over a very broad range, I'm not likely to notice that as immediately as I would be if there was a two or three dB bump from five to six kilohertz, because that's going to stand out more in that particular higher frequency region. Whereas just a broader increase in overall treble, it's going to sound like something's off to me, but it's going to be hard for me to identify it. And I've learned through reviewing and then, well, listening to speakers and then looking at measurements that when something sounds off and I can't quite identify what it is, Usually it's because it's a broad region of something. And sure enough, in the data, what I see is a dip of around, maybe like two decibels or so from about 600 hertz to I think three kilohertz. I'll have to go back and look at the data with you all shortly to verify that. We'll see that. But the overall point I'm trying to make is that when you listen to speakers that have a broader, a wider range of maybe imbalance for the lack of a better word, those issues don't tend to stand out as much as more sharper, precise imbalances. And so with that said, what I expect is that most of you will probably not catch on right away. And, and I want to make it clear that I'm not saying I've got golden ears. It's not that. It's just relating my experience, tuning systems, building systems, tuning cars, others' cars, and things like that, uh, putting together speakers and, and all that kind of stuff. My gut is telling me that you're probably going to do like I did and think, man, something, something's off, but I don't know what it is because it's not aggravating me and it's not standing out at the forefront. So what I noticed was that with vocals, it was just kind of cut through that region. And that, to me, made it sound like the mid-bass was heavier. The extension of these speakers is pretty remarkable. They are tower speakers. They have dual six and a half inch mid-bass 
a five and a quarter inch mid range, and then a, I think it's a one inch dome tweeter. And with that, these are also ported. One thing you might notice about this speaker is that the two mid bass drivers are separated by a good bit. And the bottom mid bass driver is physically closer to the floor. Now you may think, why is that? Why not just put every other speaker I've seen has the mid bass drivers right together, like one right on top of the other, or maybe they're separated by a tweeter or, or a mid range or something like that, but I've never seen them separated so far. And if you haven't, and if you're curious what it is, we refer to that as the Allison effect, or better, I should say that the reason for the placement of that bottom mid bass driver being so close to the floor is because of the Allison effect. A speaker, when you put it in the room, is going to radiate in all sorts of different areas, especially in the lower bass, mid bass region, basically omnidirectional. Now you have to worry about the wall behind the speaker, you have to worry about the side wall, but something that we often don't think about is floor bounce. So the speaker that's playing at a certain height, if you're, let's say 36 inches off the ground is the sound source, you're 36 inches off the ground and you're about a meter away. There's going to be direct sound that comes at you and then there's going to be the sound that hits the floor and then comes off the floor and hits you and that's going to be delayed. And that delayed sound is going to be somewhere in about three milliseconds region. And that's going to equal about 300 hertz or so. I mean, you can do the math and you can figure it out, but it's in that ballpark. And that means that there's going to be a dip at that frequency. Due to that dip, what you can have is a mid bass that doesn't, doesn't quite sound as punchy, maybe. It's going to sound somewhat hollow. Now, these speakers placing that bottom driver closer to the floor reduces that floor bounce effect. And in doing so, it helps, it doesn't completely resolve it, but it helps to mitigate that cancellation frequency and it will give you a more full upper mid bass sound. Another interesting thing about this design is that it seems to be the case that you don't need to put your ear at the tweeter level. Most speakers, I would say 90% of speakers, with a standard tweeter on a flat baffle, you would put your ear at that tweeter level. This speaker is about one meter tall, give or take. And when you sit down in a typical chair, what you're gonna find is that your ears are gonna be lined up with that top mid range. And the mid range is above the tweeter. You may think that that's weird. I did too. But I found out that that's actually within some margin of error the reference axis, the design axis that the designer intended you to listen to this speaker at. And it actually shows up as being vetted out in the measurements. So when I did my measurements, I initially started off at the tweeter and then I took this advice and I set the reference point to that top mid range or thereabouts. And in doing so, I actually found out that the upper mid range, lower treble smooths out through there and you have a more cohesive upper mid range sound. So when you are listening, don't be alarmed that your ears aren't at the tweeter level. That's okay. And that's actually by design. Now going back to bass, there's plenty of it. You might not have to get a subwoofer for two channel listening. That's going to depend on your music, but you could probably get away without having to use a subwoofer for two channel listening. Kick drums with these speakers is like legit. I mean, it is punch you in the chest. And I love that. You don't have to be a bass head to appreciate a solid kick drum. And when you hear it, it adds so much more to the music that you're listening to because a weak kick drum on a weak speaker, it just doesn't have the heft that the song really requires, right? Like I, I if the song has a solid kick drum, man, I want to feel that kick drum. I want to hear that kick drum. And the thing that kind of works out well with these having that reference plane vertically at the mid range is that you actually have a little bit more leeway with these speakers. Uh, certainly being a three-way helps. You know, most two-way speakers, most bookshelf speakers, it seems, have a really narrow vertical window where you're like plus or minus 10 degrees and that's about it. And for most rooms, that's going to be okay. 
But when you're using speakers for a home theater setting, you know, 10 degrees can matter a lot. If you're sitting in the primary row and you've got the the right positioning vertically, and then somebody behind you is 15 or 20 degrees above that, that primary listening axis, well, if that speaker doesn't have a good crossover and that handoff from the mid-range to the tweeter is very narrow in vertical radiation, then intelligibility typically is lost through that region because there's basically a suck out through there. But we don't have that with these speakers. It's actually a good bit broader. I'd say on the data, it's about plus or minus 20 to 30 degrees. So you've got more leeway there, which makes these speakers a good option for a home theater setting where you have multiple rows. In terms of output capability and distortion, I didn't really hear anything that stood out to me as an issue. I was using the NAD C3050 that was also loaned to me for review. That's rated at about 100 watts at 4 ohm and 8 ohm. I can do a little bit more than that. At 10 feet away with an 18 by 14 by 9 foot room, it was way more than enough for these speakers. Okay, so let's talk about the data now. All the data that you're about to see is captured using my Clipple near field scanner. It's a state of the art device that allows me to get anechoic data in a non anechoic room so we can see. Now, what is the speaker itself doing before you even put it into a room? And that also helps us to get an idea of what equalization can we put on the speaker and improve the overall performance or change it to meet a characteristic that we may like before it enters the room and then take the guesswork out of things. Here we have the frequency response, average sensitivity of about 85.1 decibels. See this bump right here around between like what, 80 Hertz and 100 Hertz? That gives a little bit more attack, a little bit more punch I like that. F3 of 47 hertz, so I misspoke earlier. It's actually 47 hertz, which is really low on its own, whereas most speakers will fall off pretty rapidly below that. This speaker actually extends out a little bit further with an F10 of 26 hertz. Now, see how this has like a little bit of a knee right here? That's similar to the KEF R3 Meta in how it uses an extended base shelf response. And in doing so, what this actually means is you can put the speaker a little bit closer to the wall and you won't suffer too much boominess. Going higher in frequency that we can see the retolerance is about plus or minus three decibels. It's pretty good. One thing that stands out to me is this 500 Hertz resonance right here because otherwise the response looks pretty decent. This is the CEA 2034 data set. And to see like what, how EQable is this speaker if we wanted to apply some EQ once we set it up in the room, and even if you don't, what's the consistency of the on versus off axis response? We can get an idea from that by looking at the ERDI. So the more linear this is, the more smooth it's gonna sound in room, for a lack of a better word. And also, the more capable it is of taking well to equalization. Where there are these dips and peaks right here, we have to factor in this is a multi-way speaker with multiple drivers spread over long distances, in some case, like the bottom mid-bass driver. So you're going to have ERDI differences right there. And I think that's probably one of them without going and measuring the individual drive units. Through here, it's reasonably flat, but we see right in here, it kind of takes a dip and comes back up. And that also aligns with this sound power in early reflections directivity index, where it's kind of a dip and then comes back up. Now, again, some of that is going to be to the vertical distance separation of the tweeter, mid-range, mid-range, mid-bass, that kind of thing. But for the most part, this speaker does look pretty EQable. Now, this is the estimated in room response at zero degrees pointed directly at me, and then at 30 degrees pointed off axis, which would be like this. Now, if I had in my subjective line of kind of what I heard, this would be it. I take the objective data and I lay a line and I say, okay, in the room, what I heard was a scooped mid range. And this is what we see right through here. This high frequency peaking of this titanium dome driver, I don't think that I heard that, so I'm not gonna complain about that too much. Another thing is, here's this mid-bass bump. I like it. I like a little bit of a mid-bass bump. This is the horizontal contour plot. Now, what I'm noticing here is that we've got a bit of a discrepancy here of about 10 to 15 degrees from one kilohertz to about three kilohertz. So there is some ballooning, which implies that the crossover between the mid-range and the tweeter isn't quite in sync. That could be by design, but it's worth noting that what you're likely to hear is a little bit of a broadening, a little bit of an enveloping sound in that two to three kilohertz region, 
which could sound a little bit attacky. Let's say attack is usually in that two to three kilohertz, well, one to three kilohertz. Clarity and detail are also in that region. So depending on the aiming of the speakers in your room and the room itself, if the side walls are extra reflective, then you're gonna get extra energy being reflected back at you. It could sound a little bit too attacky, a little bit too detailed. Personally, I didn't have that issue in the room that I was listening in though. And then above about five kilohertz or so, we can see that the speaker starts to narrow up in radiation pretty quickly, but it does remain pretty consistent throughout. I mentioned earlier vertically that you could sit above or below the tweeter by about 20 degrees, 30 degrees. It's actually around 25 degrees. You know, there's kind of an art to this science, if you will. Um, but the point being, you have more leeway with this particular speaker than you do most other speakers because it's a three-way distortion at 86 decibels, distortion at 96 decibels. And you know, even though it does go above 3% at about 60 Hertz, number one, okay. Number two, it's second order distortion. There's a clear separation of third order distortion. The motor on this speaker must be pretty dang good. Multitone distortion shows some issues around four or 500 Hertz. I didn't hear that in my listening. Higher frequency distortion, this is around 1% right through here, below 1% through here. If you use a subwoofer, you do cut off some of that four or 500 Hertz distortion right through here. And then we look at compression. This is different. What I'm seeing is we don't have compression. We have enhancement below about 50, 60 Hertz, somewhere in that region. So it could actually sound like the bass is louder the more you turn it up at around 50 Hertz. It's kind of interesting. Otherwise, this compression data indicates this speaker will sound very dynamic and I would say that it does. To sum it all up, really here's what I think, okay? The mid bass and lower bass output is really impressive for these for a tower speaker period. And at the price of about $2,000 per pair, I think that's good, right? Like so tower speaker wise, I don't have a lot of tower speakers that I've measured and reviewed and can tell you how low they get, but I think that they do Probably they're probably one of the better ones in that price class. The mid range suck out to me was noticeable, but it wasn't problematic. And like I said earlier, with a couple bands of EQ, you could really go in and kind of smooth that out and get what you want out of it. There is plenty of output. I think a home theater is going to be perfectly happy with these in terms of output capability. Certainly a smaller two channel stereo rig is going to do just fine. 100 watts worked well for me. Just make sure that whatever amplifier you're using is capable of driving a four ohm load because this speaker does dip down below four ohms. That does it for this review. I appreciate you all watching. If you'd like to support this channel, just keep in mind, I use generic affiliate links. I have them in the description for this video in the section below. You can go to Amazon, Crutchfield, Best Buy, Target. I mean, there's all sorts of just generic affiliate links. Click that if you need to buy anything. That definitely helps me out. I appreciate it. Alternatively, you can join me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. With that said, I'm taking off. I'll talk to y'all later. Take care. Peace.